Hello, everybody, and welcome hey. back after this break. Um, we are going to continue now with the documentation lesson until 12.30 or 13.30, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Samantha. We have met already yesterday. I'm a geoinformatics specialist at CSC in Finland. And here with me is Jarno. Hey. Yeltsin. Yeah, you saw me last week, but um, I'm from Aalto University, um, a research software engineer there. So let, why don't we just go into it? Um, so I'm writing a question in the HackMD. Um, what would you like to see in documentation um, of something you use? So if you uh, can answer there, write a kind of a wish list. So what do we what do we want to see in documentation? Um, and so if you're looking for information about a code or something, what are you yeah. looking for? Yeah. What do you want to know about code? So we have some answers in our um, in the lesson material, but um, we'll let you write yeah, down some things first. <laughs> let's go there now. So um, for everyone following here from the workshop page, we can go into the documentation and end up in the main page of this. And we will start with the motivation and wish list. So why do we want to document code? You will now write down like, what is what do you want to see? But why, why should we actually, actually start documenting uh, the code that we write? Yeah. And I guess uh, one answer is like for you, for yourself later, like if you're working on many different projects and you've written the code and then you switch to another project and then you come back later and you might not know every detail anymore. Um, and then you can uh, like uh, go to the documentation, however you have written that and uh, take a look at what, what were your thought processes maybe uh, how is it actually used? What have I written? What have I written about? And why have I written it? And yeah, so um, in general, like we've said a few times during this uh, course, your most common collaborator is yourself in the future. And so it's worth going through uh, many of these steps, many uh, using many of these workflows that we talk about, just that you, so that when you come back to your own code, you know what's going on. And um, yeah, you can understand the code, you can run it, and you know that it works. But then also others, like if you're sharing your code, hopefully, uh, maybe on GitHub or somewhere else, um, if they stumble across your GitHub repository, what would you like them to know? Uh, that's also a good like place you have then the documentation so that they know why have you written this code what can you do what can be done with it how it is how it how is it installed or used and so maybe then people can also think of if they want to contribute to your code because they actually understand what it's doing without reading through hundred thousand lines of lines of code but they can find the information from the documentation to start with or at least they'll be able to use it, so they don't have to. You're saving some time for them. At least they don't have. To, uh, they don't have to rewrite everything. Right. And then there's also the point of uh, if you don't have documentation, if you just have code, and you share it with others, with your colleagues, for example, at work, it does not even have to be public. But uh, your your the first question of your colleague will then probably be like, hey, how do you, how do I actually install it, or how do I get started? How how do I use your code um, without like spending a lot of time on just trying out different things? So this frequently asked questions, like you can basically use the documentation to shield your valuable time um, from these kind of questions by just writing it down into some document that then tells others and how to use it, how to install it, and those things. Okay. Um... And then there is yeah, so there's uh, some good points there. Um, <laughs> so there's different kinds of documentation. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, we have, uh, for example, tutorials, um, which is done for newcomers on how to get started, how to, um, how to use your code to do anything really. Uh, then we have also, if you want to show how to solve a specific problem, it's more like these how-to guides, more goal-oriented, or then also more understanding-oriented if you want to explain a concept, um, or then also as a reference, more so more information-oriented, uh, describing the machinery behind your code. So all of these may be needed in your project or may not be needed. You need to kind of think about your target, target audience and um, yeah, so um, why are you publishing the code and who you are actually planning to use it? Yeah, and very important here is like, while we will be demonstrating a few different ways on how you can write documentation, or you will also be doing exercises with it, uh, there is really no one size fits all. Like there's bigger projects, there's smaller projects, there is projects that are used only by your colleagues or by yourself. There's projects that are for a bigger audience. So you always have to like think of, like Jarno said, what is your target audience? What do they want to know? Uh, sometimes a readme like we have seen already in the GitHub repositories might be totally enough for, for a small project to get people all the information they need. And um, we have here in the material a few own examples. Well, there are examples from other instructors, at least there is no none of my examples is here. Is there one of you? I don't know. And uh, no. No. So it's it's instructors that have instructed this lesson before that have put some some links to their um, documentation that they have been involved in here, and we can take a a little look at some of them and see how documentation can look. It might look a little bit different, sorry for that, because of the this portrait view. <laughs> no, so it might look a little bit nicer when you have it in the full screen mode, so you can go there by yourself. But um, we can see here already there's some introduction, introductory text on what, what it's about, um, some uh, instructions on what to do, and then there come links to manuals here, uh, where we can also take a look. In this case, it's uh, PDFs. So you can find like all the information you need there. Uh, one thing here to note is if you have ever tried to copy something from a PDF, you know that that can be very tricky. So if you have like code examples, of course, I do not find one right now, but if you, I wanted to copy like a code example from here, it might work, it might not work. That's something to keep in mind when writing documentation and using PDF for it. Um, and so that was one example. Let's look at one other example that I personally really like. Also, again, it looks a bit nicer when it's on a bigger screen. Um, so a different project. We have a nice, nice page with uh, different. Uh, it has a version here, and here you can also find different versions of the documentation. So if you're using a older version of the code, you can also find the corresponding documentation. You don't have to wonder, like, why are things different from what is it mentioned in the documentation? We have install document. Oh, the screen sharing a bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. These um, people have essentially said very similar things to what we've had um, in our wish list. The um, one note that many people have made that we, I think, don't have in our wish list is um, to use clean, clear language. Uh, by clean, I mean just getting to the point and kind of directly describing um, the things that need to be said. Um, describing what's happening. And also advance warning for um, what new concepts are going to come. So this is just, uh, this is essentially good pedagogical uh, language. And yeah, so that's a very nice thing to have in a, uh, when you're reading documentation. Of course, then people have uh, mentioned examples are very good. Tutorials are very good when you're starting on something. 
Um, interestingly, I maybe I didn't read all of it, but I did not see um, references. So these um, API documentations, that's usually not the first thing you look for. It's something you look for when you have been using the library for months or years um, and you know exactly what's going on, but you don't remember exactly how to call this function. Mm -hmm. um, so what do we have in our wish list? Well, versions. What version is this documenting? Uh, Samantha, is back. Samantha is back. Um, and one thing we mentioned is that we'll actually come back to in I think in the next section uh, some startup st standard markup language um, that is easy to edit, just because. Um, uh, if you're contributing the code, you might want to edit the documentation. Um, it's nice if the examples are copy pasteable, which um, as Samantha mentioned, is a, can be a problem with PDF files and some other formats as well. Um, when um, something is, is intended to be read by a newcomer, it's great if it's written by a human for a human. Um, so automatically generated documentation is good. Um, to have, um, but if you want to get started with a library, it's not necessarily that helpful. Okay, installation instructions, getting started instructions were mentioned, um, and information about how to contribute was actually also mentioned in HackMB. Uh, that's one of our, our uh, wish list items as well. And then, um, just clearly stating what the license is, what can I do with this software? Um, anything to add? Nice. Sounds like there's a lot, a lot of good wishes in the HackMD. Thanks for that. And also, please feel free to come back. Like we will publish this HackMD later. So if you ever get into the situation that you have to write documentation yourself. Um, you can come back and see see what we collected here and also what is in the material and think about if, if that is something that you want to have in your documentation. So should we quickly go to the tools and solutions, which I, I think we have touched on most of these already. Yes. So this should be quick. Um, um, but we'll see. So we have some um, material about this in code documentation, but we will not go through it today. Uh, in general, this in code documentation is like a first step. It's good for you, you yourself, uh, when you come back to your code after some time, or also for other programmers, because you have like really the, what, what did I think when I was writing this uh, right next to the code. But um, maybe that's, not enough for users because if you if you think about yourself and you just want to use someone else's code, you do not necessarily want to go like line by line through uh, the the actual code to find uh, how to use it or to find what it actually does. So this is for someone who's really familiar with the code already. Yeah. Then we have README files. Do you use README yeah. files? Yeah. No. Yeah, um, yeah, I will uh, cover and uh, go through some examples of readme files, talk about them in more detail. This is probably the first type of uh, user oriented documentation that you will write. And usually is one of the first files you add to a project. I usually add one before I add any code. Yeah. Just to write yeah. down what is the point of this project. <laughs> And you already noticed in GitHub, for example, the README is I think most often uh, written in Markdown, uh, what we're also using in the HackMD. Mm, and that's that's one, one of these lightweight markup languages that uh, are very popular to use for documentation. Restructured text is another one. And you can see here in the material a little bit um, how they are different. And uh, so we have here on the left, and said we have the markdown and here we have the restructured text. We will practice a markdown a little bit more in the later exercise. 
So I think there's not much more to say. Um, yeah, it's good to uh, note that we are using Markdown in the HackMD. So yeah, the language in HackMD is Markdown. Um, what we'll use is uh, in the Sphinx, well, but yeah, in a bit, in a bit. Um, what we'll use a bit later is called Mist, which has a little bit, of, well, it has some extensions. It can do a bit more than standard Markdown, but it looks very much the same. It feels very much the same. And then you can find also down here a list of HTML static site generators so that you can use for then turning your restructured text or your Markdown files into more beautiful uh, HTML pages like this one, for example. This uh, lesson material is actually written in Markdown and we turned it into HTML using Sphinx and we will do an exercise on that later. And then also if you remember the uh, Code Refinery workshop page, for example, this one um, that is generated using another HTML st static site generator called Zola. So if you go on GitHub, you can find uh, on our code refinery page, you can find the, the source code there that is written in Markdown, but what you see is then the HTML. And then there's a few other things that we already scratched upon down here that you can look at yourself. So Doxygen is maybe mostly popular in the C++ community. It's kind of the same as Sphinx otherwise. Um, well, I mean, it's originally intended to generate for generating this API or in using this encode documentation, but it can be used also um, to write the uh, user facing documentation. So um, it, it's basically a replacement, a drop in replacement for Sphinx, which uh, mostly, uh, at least Python community mostly uses. Um, and yeah, there's other drop-in replacements mainly built around other languages. So here, the next part is, uh, we'll skip that for now for writing in code documentation. You can go there and uh, see some examples on, on how it can be done. There's also a few exercises with solutions that you can look at after the course. We will go on now with the readme files. Yeah, um, should I take over the screen share? Mm -hmm. I cannot share while we can also keep it here. I'm not a host. Okay, um, let's just do it that way. Um, Richard, if you're hearing me, you can maybe allow, allow me to share my screen. Uh, okay, now I'm a co-host. So yes, um, we'll start with the readme section. Um, essentially, um, by discussion. So uh, exercise one, uh, so yeah, it's, um, sorry, um, I'm looking at my notes and I think I have things the wrong way around. So um, yeah, so this is not the discussion um, exercise. This is, uh, we're writing a readme for an example project and um, yeah, we're writing it in Markdown. So it's, probably relatively um, familiar. Now there's two other exercises, uh, optional exercises two and three, which you can go into if um, if you have time. Um, In this case, you can actually choose if you want to do readme one, two or three, like we do not. Um... Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So uh, exercise two is draft a readme for one of your recent projects. Um, so, um, we then of course don't have a solution for you, but, um, it's essentially the same exercise. Exercise three is a, a discussion on, um, so find a readme, open a readme of, a, of something you have used and, um, talk about what makes it a good readme, uh, what you would improve, um, and write down some notes, um, some collaborative notes on, um, well, on, on the discussion. So yeah, what would you do uh, to this readme file? 
So we have 15 minutes um, now in uh, exercise session, it, uh, in exercise uh, groups, yeah, right? That's a good plan. So let's um, let's have 15 minutes for the exercise and come back at 30. Come back at yeah 11:30. And we will need to come back here for a moment before the break. Hey, uh, so we're back. I hope you had time to take a look at the exercises and think about good read me's a little bit. Um, so in the summary uh, section here, just in the bottom of the page, we have a few key points of what a good read me file should have, or what a bare minimum readme file really should have. Um, so maybe these already came up in your discussion or you um, added them in your um, in your readme file. So it, it should definitely have the name of the project. Um, so, and hopefully it's somewhat descriptive of what the project does. Um, then some brief paragraph motivating or uh, telling people what this project is, why you're writing this code, or uh, why this library exists, what it's supposed to do. Then hopefully some setup instructions. How do you install it and how do you um, how do you use it for uh, some very common use case? So um, yeah, some quick start code examples you can copy and paste into um, a terminal or run um, however you normally run the code. Um, and then what's very good to have is a recommended citation. How you how do you refer to this um, this project? Um, and yeah, so beyond that, um, a readme can have a lot more useful things. It can be essentially all of your documentation. Um, but when it starts to get long enough, then we'll yeah, it's good to use something um, something more browsable, um, something more maintainable, um, which I guess we'll be talking about next. Um, but first, let's take a break. So the break will be until, let's say, 12.42. That makes sense. Oh, first. Um, Uh, I'm not showing the screen. Okay, so so first, uh, please check that you have Sphinx installed. Um, yeah, so run this Sphinx build dash dash version, and it should print any version number. Is basically anything that starts with four is great. Um, any version number is fine. Um, and this is within your code refinery environment. So if you yeah, are yeah. just opening your terminal, you can type. I can actually do it here. So we can do conda activate code refinery. And then we type the sphinx minus build minus minus version. And if that gives you out some kind of version and not an error, then everything is fine for the next exercise. If you have any problems, then let us know in the HackMD. Um, but now we'll have the break until 43, right? Yeah. See you then. Right. Oh, see you. Okay, welcome back. I hope you had a good break and could walk around a little bit and everything. So, um, and we saw some errors with Sphinx in the HackMD. I hope this could be resolved. If not, then uh, I would suggest to lean back and follow along the type along and try again later. Uh, hopefully we can help you still in the HackMD to figure it out, but maybe then it's more beneficial to, to see uh, how it would be done and then get back to it later. So in this exercise, um, we will now build a documentation using Markdown. So using the very same language that we're using in the HackMD already. 
And the goal is to, to build an HTML that uh, we have locally on our computers and can view in our browser. And as an example for, uh, I've mentioned already before that uh, these materials pages here that we have in Code Refinery are actually built using Sphinx. So if you click here on the source code button, or you could also find up here this edit on GitHub to find then the actual code of this material. Um, we can see uh, some familiar things maybe uh, that we have like headers like this. So this is our very big header up here. And if you have a larger screen now, you can put it next to each other and can uh, observe a bit how it looks in Markdown, which we can read already. But then in HTML, it's of course a bit nicer to see these boxes, to see the like uh, bigger printed text and so on. So here you can see how that is done, at least in our case. Um, it might not be possible to do these kind of boxes the same way in all uh, in all kinds of uh, markdown flavors. So you always have to check which, which flavor you're using. Okay. Um, so let me make this a little bit smaller to start with this. So I hope during the break you could uh, test the versions of your Sphinx built and Sphinx quick start, it could give you something along this. I've created my environment yesterday and that's, I got the 4.4.0 version. Um, a few of the early ones I think are also okay with even earlier ones, there might be some problems so then try to update it. And let's scroll down here to Sphinx one exercise. So this one we're gonna do as a type along so if you have no problems with things, then I would ask you to type along now, because then you can later in the exercise session where you go with your teams, um, continue with Sphinx 2 exercise. Um, but yeah, if you have problems with Sphinx, then you can also just watch now and try out later. So please let me know if my, um, terminal is big enough and also I have the, the history of my commands up here. So you can always see after the, I executed a command what I typed. Uh, we are in the code refinery environment, conda activate code refinery, if you're not there yet to get there. And then the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create an environment, uh, create a directory, sorry with mkdir, which we call doc example. Um, then we're going to switch into that uh, directory, change directory, cd doc minus example. And this is now empty. I can show you ls for list the directory content. So it does not show anything. So this is right now empty. And Sphinx pro provides a very nice way of getting started with your documentation uh, using this Sphinx minus quick start um, command. Okay, so we start that and then we will be asked a few questions. Uh, so first it, uh, shows us here some text. Let me just scroll up a bit. So welcome to Sphinx. Um, now we can uh, fill in some values or we can accept the default values. The selected root path is where we are currently. So in our doc example directory. Um, and now the first question is if we want separated source and build directories. Here we can use the default, which is uh, no indicated like this here. If you wanted to have separated the source and build directory as mentioned here, you could put yes, but let's put no for now. Enter. Then um, 
we will have to give the project name and here we can give like documentation example that will later appear in many different places along your doc documentation and we can we can take a look at that afterwards then we can uh, put the author name or also names whoever is writing it which is me <laughs> um, we can uh, put the project release so uh, the the version number of our documentation that we are writing right now and let's start with 0 0.1 in this case Okay. So yeah, you can find uh, if you if this is going too fast, you can find all the things that we are doing right now uh, in the lesson material documentation slash things. And here it also tells you hit enter, give the project name and hit enter. Then um, the project language. So we can change that here. Well, our our documentation will be in English, so we can use enter again to set that at, as our project language and then let's see what it said here so that this was the last question and then it created a few files it tells us about it it tells us that it's finished uh, it tells us that this initial directory structure has been created so we are now ready to go and populate our documentation. So let me scroll down here as well. This is a little bit easier to see than in my terminal. Oops. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so if we now look, list the directory content, which was empty before, now after running quick, uh, Sphinx quick start and going through all these steps, we have uh, our. Um, directory populated with many different files. So we can take a look here in the lesson material as well um, that we have now a conf.py file. You can see it also here, which is uh, the configuration file for our documentation written in Python. Then we have a main file in uh, uh, for Sphinx, which is called index.rst, note here the ending, rst for the restructured text. We have a, a directory where the, our documentation will be built uh, when we build it, and we run Sphinx build, uh, which is this underscore build. And then we have some templates directory, static directory, uh, where we can put either the HTML templates into templates and some static files that we want to use, for example, images, um, some styles or stuff like that, we can put in this static directory. And then we have this uh, make file and the make.bat file. Um, if you want to build your documentation using make or using make on Windows for this bat file. Um, we will not use these two files. We will use Sphinx to build our um, documentation now. So let's take a look at this index.rst file. And here you can now use any editor you like. I will use nano for it because we will also be changing a few things in this index.rst file. So we can call nano index rst and hopefully for you this looks a little bit nicer <laughs> it looks a bit cramped but we see that there is already some content there you can also see it in the lesson material again so uh, we are looking at restructured text so everything that starts with these two dots here is a comment um, it just tells us about where we are how it was created and when can be very helpful in the future. And it also tells us that we can actually adapt this file, um, but that we should not touch or leave this uh, 
this root talk tree directive, which we can find a little bit lower also in our nano. Let's go there, going down. So we have this talk tree, which is the table of contents tree. So everything that we want uh, our documentation to contain, we would put underneath here. And here it's maybe worth mentioning that uh, Sphinx is very, um, how do you say, very distinct, very, it likes its indentation exactly the way it wants it. So uh, if you have any, any issues building later, then uh, it's usually a good first step to go back and check your indent indentations. So everything that we have, for example, in this talk tree, in this table of contents, should now also have the indentation of four space, three spaces, actually. So I'm not sure if you mentioned this, um, maybe yep. I missed it. Um, this is um, RST file, uh, dot .rst, so this is rich text, uh, which we mentioned quickly. It's kind of like Markdown, but it's not exactly Markdown. So um, no, it will look a little bit different. Um, we'll not go into it any more than that, but it's something you'll see around. Yeah. And um, because we remember that in the top here, it says that we can adapt this completely to our liking, but uh, should leave the talk tree directive, we leave that talk tree directive, but we can remove this indices and tables. So I'll remove this here because we, we currently we don't have any use for it. You can later check what it actually does and maybe it would help you in your documentation, but for now we don't need it. So I remove that, you can do the same. And then we go back up here. So under the talk tree directive, we can now um, add, and I think, what did we call it here? A feature minus A. So uh, if we want to now add a file to our um, documentation that is called feature A, we can use that here. Uh, we can add that here, feature A.md, which is a file that we have not yet, we don't have that yet but we will create it in a moment. So be aware of these three spaces here to get the correct indentation. And then we will save that file in nano that is control O, file name to write index.rst that we leave with enter and we leave nano with control X. So now we have done something to our index.rst file. And um, now we also have to do something to our configuration file. So I mentioned before, we have a configuration file that is called conf. No, we should use nano again, or I use nano, you can use whichever one you want and go into the conf.py uh, file. And Jarno, you keep the hack MD in in I, if there's something coming up that we can mention here. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Um. Um, oh yeah, I, I just see empty lines might also be important. So uh, uh, it's always good to, to leave a bit of space. It gives you a better overview, but Sphinx also needs it in some places. I think in the place where we actually now put our feature A, it needs it. To, to read it correctly. So we go now into the configuration file, conf.py. And there is a lot of stuff there already. Most of it is not so interesting for us um, right now. You can take a look at that later if you want to, but here we can find now, remember it asks us what project name we want to give our project. And I called it documentation example. It asks me what the author is, I, I put me there. So we can find this information here. And if later we think that, oh, me was actually not the right author, then we can come back and uh, change it here as well to change it for our whole documentation. The year it got from the, the, the date of creation, we did not give that, but it gets that automatically. Uh, so here you can find then also the release 
the version number that we gave. You can change that here later. And then the important part here is now these extensions, a bit further down. So currently there is no, no extensions used, but as uh, Jarno mentioned in the last part, uh, we will be using this MIST uh, parser to parse the markdown files that we will be writing to be used with Sphinx. So we have to add that here, MIST underscore parser with the quotation marks. And then we also need to add the source suffix because we want it to find RST files as well as the markdown files, RST, and then comma and markdown MD. So this is important for us right now. If you are very uh, familiar or really like this uh, RST files, then you can also write your whole documentation in them and would not have to add this missed parser in this case because it's the default of Sphinx. And well, you can look a little bit yourself what comes here below. Uh, there is a few different things that you can change and that you can play around, but you will get to it when you need it, I would say not so important right now. So we save this file again with control O into conf pi, enter, and then exit nano with control X. So now we added this uh, feature minus a dot MD to the table of contents in the index file. So let's create it actually, because right now we don't have it. So it would not find it. And um, yeah, it would be nice to, to actually see something rendered when we, when we build the documentation. So we can just use nano again. Uh, if the file is not there yet, it will create it for us. Feature minus A. Now remember that uh, whatever name you gave it there in the table of contents, you can also use here. I hopefully called it feature minus A and that MD, but we, Sphinx will notify yeah, us if that's so. an issue. <laughs> okay, so uh, we use our editor again to create feature minus a dot md. And now we can write some markdown. So we can write a, a header with this one hash. And if, if we have then a subheader, for example, we can do that with two, two of these hash symbols. Uh, to create a subsection. Then we can write some text here that is interesting. Um, then we can also, you have practiced now actually already the lists, how to do lists in Markdown. So we can have either the numbering, like you're doing the numbering of the questions in the HackMD, or we can also have like a bullet point list with some item one, another item two, oops. And here is also again, a space after the bullet point. And then let's see what we have in the example here more. Oh yeah, you can also use the minus, of course, in this case. And then we get back to these funky empty lines. Um, so if we want to use a nested, nested item list. So item 2.1, we give an empty line and then two spaces and then item 2.2. .2. And then we can also, again, an empty line and then go to item three. So now we have created a new file, feature minus A. You can add whatever you want. You don't have to write all of it or you can write more. It does not really matter, but uh, I just write something and save the file again, control O. We write it to feature minus A dot ND. Yes, enter control X to leave nano. And now we can see if we list the directory 
um, that we have here now, the feature A, on the same level as the index.rst. And now we can actually go and build our documentation from the markdown file that we have just written. So for that, Sphinx provides this tool called Sphinx minus build. And that one we will have to tell from where we want to build it. So where is this index.rst with all the information and where is this conf.py with all the uh, configuration information. And we have that all in the current directory. So we can use the dot. If you have it somewhere else, then you would give the path there. And then uh, we have to tell it where we want to store the built HTML files. And for that, we already saw that uh, Sphinx has created, this Sphinx quick start has created for us this underscore build directory. Jarno, do you know actually why why does it have the underscore? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, we actually need to please tell us in, in the hack. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, many, many, uh, if, if you have a, comp if you're using compiled language, uh, you would often call uh, the directory where you compile it build without the underscore. So maybe they just want to avoid using that. Um, Maybe. But also, usually documentation would be in a different folder, so it's not a huge deal. Okay, so we use Sphinx build from here where we are that we indicate with the dot and then into the build directory and press enter. And now, Sphinx, um, if we, for example, had a different name of the file in the index.rst. So if we would have had a typo and called it feature or something like that, um, then things would notify, uh, notify us of that here. But it seems like uh, all went fine. There is nothing bad red happening. Uh, it tells us exactly what it's doing. So updating some environment reading the sources, reading, looking for now outdated files and writing output. Okay. So now we can go into our underscore build uh, directory. Let's just go switch in there, change directory CD underscore build and check what is there. Maybe we should have looked in there first, but uh, I can tell you that before we ran this Sphinx build, it was actually empty. There was nothing in there, but now we have some HTML files and we can now here find again, um, the index file it was index.rst before it's now index.html and then also our feature a.html and then a few other ones that are not so important for us right now. And uh, now it depends on which operating system you're on. I'm actually not sure in which one it will open it for me, but let's say, let's see, I'm on Linux. So I type xdg minus open and then the index.html to take a look at it. And it actually opened it somewhere else. Let me just, whoops, move that here. So it now should have opened a web browser for you with the path to your index.html file um, and shows you, oh, wow, well, it looks a bit squished for you. It probably looks a little bit nicer with this navigation bar actually on the left, but it, you can see it's now already responsive. So we built this nice basis of a documentation where you can now um, add contents the same way that we did now with this some feature A. And you will find this here in the table of contents. You can click some feature A and then you find the header that we wrote. You can find the subheader and our list with the, in, in, uh, with the nested list items here. And um, Maybe one last thing before we go into the exercise. 
group, uh, exercise groups is that this may not look the nicest for you if you're saying like, okay, this uh, looks a bit boring. I want more fancy or I want uh, some nicer things. And therefore, if you remember in the conf.py, there was also an HTML theme um, keyword where we can change this uh, setup of the page. So right now, let's go there. Uh, let's check out nonoconf.py again to see further down. Here was the extensions. And then here, here is the HTML theme. So this one that we are using now is called Alabaster, but we have also uh, available in the environment, the read the docs theme, which is called in this case, Sphinx underscore RTD theme, which we could use here instead, if we want to. Um, we save the file with control O, enter and exit nano with control X. And then we can run the command to build again. So Sphinx build, uh, the dot underscore build to rebuild our documentation, but now with a different theme. And if you run that and then um, reload your page where the where your page was built then you can find that oh now it looks much nicer maybe for some maybe for, for some others it does not look so nice but uh, even though we did not actually type very much we got this super nice starting point of a documentation page and that's what sphinx is really good at other tools as well of course um so but now of, um yeah. Points in them. Well, actually, the point I was looking at um, already has a really good answer, and maybe we should just move on to the exercise to have, um, okay, to have the twenty minutes or so. Yeah, please uh, read uh, the questions and answers in the HackMD. There's nice people answering everything, hopefully to your satisfaction. Um, if you need help. And now we go for, well, 15 minutes into the exercise groups to do this Sphinx 2 exercise. And I noticed that I've taken more time than I should have. I'm sorry for that. Um, mm, not a problem. But we will then, after the exercise, come back to this room and summarize what we have learned in this documentation lesson. One um, important comment from the HackMD um, yes. that I saw a couple of times, um, that the pacing for this one was perfect. Okay, well then I'm <clears> happy <throat> and I'm sorry that we therefore have to skip over other points, but the material is there and you can look at it. Yeah. So now for 15 minutes until uh, 28, According to my clock, we do Sphinx 2 in exercise groups. And please use the HackMD uh, to ask more questions. Let us know how it's going. And we'll see you back two minutes before end of this day. Have fun. Um, we're back. Hope you had uh, fun with the exercise and um, we are really out of time. So unfortunately um, you have to be satisfied with the answers in HackMD, um, uh, which of course you can continue to use um, after the uh, official close as well. Um, but yeah, so we, uh, we, so maybe you had time to try this different syntax and maybe even the math um, section. And you can find more about Markdown, uh, more about Sphinx uh, following these links. So there's a two um, lessons here about deploying automatically to GitHub pages and about hosting 
um, your own website, you, just an HTML page that uh, you write on GitHub pages, or hosting your README file for your project on GitHub pages. Uh, so those are both useful, um, but unfortunately we don't have time for them right now. Um, so feel free to read them on uh, your own time and um, ask questions from us anywhere. And try it out. It's really yeah, fun. Yeah, try, do try it I out. I had a yeah. suggested try it out. So one thing maybe very quickly worth noting. So this is the source code for this exercise. And we do in fact use exactly the kind of workflow. Um, so there is this dot uh, github slash workflows uh, folder that contains this YAML file. Um, so if you read the um, read the part about deploying Sphinx documentation to GitHub pages, um, that's exactly what we use to build this website. So what it does is it, it will automatically take what you write in the Markdown files and turn them into a website when you push to GitHub. So that's really neat. Okay, so there was a question on HackMD. Um, sorry, I'm now on the summary page. Um, so I uh, click through to the summary page at the end of the session. And let's zoom in a little bit. Um, so there was a question on HackMD about when you use Sphinx. And um, here we specifically address readme's versus Sphinx, but it's a more general question. So um, Sphinx can build a more complicated website. It can have this index on the side uh, where you can click through the different pages. And it has a lot of extensions that allow you to do neat things like use equations or automatically take in code, doc in code documentation from your code and put it on the website. Um, all we have really uh, useful or and complicated things. And README is uh, one page. So if it's, a, if it's not a big project, a single README file is definitely enough. Um, it, it's often um, more than enough. But if it's a bigger project, you, then um, you might want to have a more complicated website and then you want something like Sphinx. Also, just uh, worth mention, if, uh, if it's a closed source project, you probably don't want to publish your code with the readme file on GitHub. So, you know, you need some other way of building a website. And Sphinx is really good for that. Okay. Often Jupyter, which uh, the first half of the day was about, often Jupyter is good enough to document your scripts. Um, if it's not more complicated than a script, then yeah, that's probably um, what you need. Um, and then, well, a couple of other points. So Sphinx or GitHub pages are both. Um, so you can, um, you can put your Sphinx Paid, uh, Sphinx things on GitHub pages, but you can also just serve a single file there and that's often enough. Um, there are other, other services as well that are listed in the common tools section that you might want to check out if you're building something more complicated. Um, but anything else, Samantha, do you have something you would like to bring up before we end? No, I think that was it and we're already over time, so we should end yeah. here. Okay, so thanks for um, thanks for listening. Thanks for the useful comments on HackMD and oh, yes, yeah. and also remember that you can yourself create issues on our lesson material if you find some typos, mistakes, or anything that you want us to know. Uh, since we use did of that. ran out of time and we didn't do it yet, should we paste the feedback section or write the feedback section? I think someone is doing that. Great. Oh yes, okay. it's being written. So if you have time, uh, please do fill in the feedback. Um, but of course, you know we are already over time, so uh, no pressure. So yeah, see you around. <laughs>